Hello and welcome to the Odds Checker Royal Ascot Preview. I'm your host, George Ellick, and this is Tuesday's preview podcast, the first day of Royal Ascot, which takes place tomorrow. So this is being recorded on Ascot Eve, you could say, and I'm joined by two esteemed guests, uh, both regulars to this uh, to this podcast. Although, Mike, we haven't seen you for, for, for a while. Um, you're replaced by far worse, uh, worse panel members, uh, I shouldn't say that, in the last couple of weeks. But Mike Spence, uh, pro punter, and, uh, and a bit of a shrewdy, it's fair to say, uh, joins me to my right. And uh, to my left is the one and only Andy Holding, odds checker's very own tipster, as ever, enjoying uh, a fabulous year. Always uh, seems to be getting in profit, and we look forward to reading your previews um, ahead of this week. But we hope that maybe you'll give one or two things away to us, uh, on the, whether you're listening to this or, or by the video. <laughs> um, yeah, please don't just keep it on under wraps. Um, but we'll get straight into it now. There's no point. Um, faffing about. What I will ask you both about before we start um, with the Queen Anne is, is about the, the conditions. Uh, racing in the UK over the last uh, week or two has been um, mainly kind of taking place on, on soft or heavy ground. Um, how much does that affect your, your strategy here? How do you expect the ground to be um, over the course of the week? And is it a case, if it is going to be on, on the softer side, is it a case of keeping your powder slightly more dry or just looking for the horses that, that fit that profile? Uh, well, at the moment, it's good on the straight course and it's good with good soft in places on the round course. But uh, the going stick is quite a big difference between the two. It's 7.4 on the round and 8.4 on the straight. Um, and there's also the danger of quite a bit of, quite a bit of rain tomorrow and Wednesday, albeit it's probably later tomorrow afternoon. It, it, it does make quite a big impact, I think. It's, it's gonna be, the rain seems very hit or miss. It doesn't, at the moment, it seems like we're going to get a lot or, or little. So um, it's going to play part, quite a big part, especially backing anything at the start of the week now, I think. Um, it's what you've got to be careful of, really. I th- it's definitely not going to be good to firm anyway, certainly yeah. on the first two or three days. And you, the, the words keep your powder dry don't come into your dictionary, I know that. So do you, is it a case of just looking for horses that maybe, I mean, depending on, on how the ground goes, just, just tailoring your bets to, to however it suits? Yeah, I mean, I've had a couple of anti-post bets for the first day and to be honest, I was a little bit worried about soft ground for the one, two-year-old, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, not so much my, my first anti-post bet. I think he'll handle pretty much what he's throwing at him but I think it's a it's a it's a point worth making that you need to monitor what's happening of course over the next few days it's going to be very important I think if you're going to have a, a decent bet the most reliable day I think is actually going to be the first day because they've had the rain it will have settled down nicely it is good ground drying out um, the forecast is for quite a heavy band of thundery showers to come through Tuesday afternoon stroke early evening amounting to anything between 50 and 50 mil, they've said, if you get a really bad um, thunderstorm. Of course, it's going to be localised, so Ascot might miss it, which it sometimes does. It can rain 10 miles down the road, and Ascot, very similar to Cheltenham, seems to miss out. So you need to monitor that, especially going into Wednesday and Thursday. If they get the rain forecast, which is predicted, it could have a massive effect on the draw, horses' chances later on in the week, particularly on the round track, because it's already softer than the straight track. But I think the first day... Um, I think we're going to be dealing with genuine good ground. So, hit them with both barrels, I'd say, in the first, <laughs> first few races. Let's get stuck in. Let's get stuck in, exactly. In the first race here is the Queen Anne. Um, and the favourite, which Andy tipped up after the lock in, is Le Brevido, currently at 5 to 1. Andy tipped it up one point each way at 14 to 1. So, if you ever need to be sold on why it's important to read Andy's column, that in a nutshell is that. Um, Mustachery next up at 11 to 2. Barney Roy. Six to one, uh, Lauren's thirteen to two, has a poor ten to one, uh, accidental agent twelve to one, sixteen to one bar. Um, obviously, Andy, given that you tipped up Le Bravido at fourteens uh, and is now five to one, um, <clears throat> your opinion on this race may have changed. Um, so, how, how are you looking at it at the moment at the current prices? Um, yeah, of course, I've I've now got to do this podcast and try not to do it through rose tinted glasses and. It can become a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, can't it, just to talk largely about one horse that you do think has got an excellent chance, particularly at the odds that are available straight after the lock But I think the lock is the race we need to concentrate on. It often throws up the winner of this race, not necessarily the winner of that race wins. Accidental engine, of course, was at a big eye-catcher in last year's race, and he come on to um, turn the form around with many that, that were worse drawn in the first race last year. And I think... The point to make about that lock it was a race where the, the track bias once again reared its ugly head 
and it very much played into the hands of several that got the benefit of being on the speed and in the right part of the track and others like Le Bravido didn't. If you go back and watch the run of Le Bravido, he was drawn 14 of 14 to start off with, hence the fact that he drifted bad. I think a lot of people who play the draw bias at Newbury wanted to lay him and get it stuck into him. So he was at the back of the field. In fact, he was last with three to run. And then there was two or three horses that went in front of him and they were dropping back and he, it was a knock-on concertina effect. He got switched out wide onto the even slower part of the track. But then from that point onwards, from about 200, he really did roll home quite well. He ended up finishing a never near a fifth. I upgraded it massively and I could not believe the odds that bookmakers uh, on the Sunday when I was looking at the re replays, I was thinking, well, they're watching a different race to me. Uh, some firms went 14 to one. It just made absolutely no sense whatsoever. He was actually three times bigger at the time than Mustachery. So bookmakers were basically saying that Mustachery was a three times better horse than the Bravida, which of course is absolute nonsense. Um, he's got great form at Ascot. Of course, he's a winner here of the jersey. And if you go back and watch his jersey win, he came from the slowest part of the track that day. There was a two groups, there was about four or five that finished second, third and fourth this side. And down the middle where he was, he had no right to win. He must have beat the other by about 10 lengths and still won. He's got good form with ease in the ground. Of course, he was second to Bram uh, Bramalot in the um, French 2000 Guineas <coughs> in 2017. So he ticks a lot of boxes. Aidan O'Brien won this race three times. He's also drawn where the pace is. I think that's another important point to make. Um, he's drawn his stall two. Now, from my knowledge, I think Lawrence is probably likely to lead. She's drawn six. So I think those fancied horses, your Barney Roy's, your Mustachery's, your Hazapaws, Lawrence, Bravida, Bravid, all drawn single figures towards that middle to far side. So he should be able to get plenty of cover in the hands of Ryan Moore. They're going to go quick. It'll suit him. Look, I, I think he's got a great chance. For those of us that back to him at big odds, everything is set fair. The ground, everything is right. Um, I'd probably throw one other into the mix at a big price just because I'm trying to come up with something else if you haven't already had a bet. I do think one master's a big price. Um, William Haggis's filly. She also has won here at Ascot. She was definitely short of a run the day at uh, the Curra behind Beshiar, Beshi Stabber Companion. Um, Woody Haggis went on records to say that she wouldn't need that run but she won't mind the giving the ground either and she's 25 to 1 but um, 20, 20 to 1 at the moment my master yeah yeah sorry did I say 20 yeah, 20 to 1 so there'll be very very long faces in holding towers yeah. <laughs> if uh, La Bravido doesn't at least get into the frame at the very least let's say well Mike I don't think there's much more we can say about La Bravido after that um, from, from Andy so let's maybe look at uh, some of the other runners in the field uh, Mustastri Mish Mish will obviously prove popular mm. having beaten La Bravido um, last time to those who, who haven't looked at the race in quite as much detail as, as Andy. Now, Barney Roy has made an impressive comeback, um, having not raced since 2017, now for Charlie Appleby. Um, Lauren's obviously a very consistent performer as well. Um, how are you eyeing up this one? Uh, I, th I, th I think... You can talk about La Bravido if you want to. I, I will talk about La Bravido <laughs> because I, I think this horse will probably either win or he, I think he could come towards the rear of the field. I, w I was very concerned with how he sweated up and how he went to post at Newbury. Um, I thought he went, you know, he went, to the, went to post terribly. He, he was horrendous before the race. He, he'd, he'd almost lost his race before, um, which obviously is then a plus considering how well he was able to finish and run it. And I do agree he ran very well, but <laughs> how I saw him that day in the, in the parade ring start and everything, I'd be absolutely amazed if if he was in good nick by the time they get to the start at Royal Ascot. So for me, he... You he, think he's a vulnerable favourite? I think he's a vulnerable favourite. I, I, you know, if he got to the start and he was looking looking well, then, he, then he, yeah, I, I agree. He probably was the one. He was certainly the one to take out the locking from behind. Um, but I could <laughs> never be backing him before, before he got to the post at the moment. 14s is, you know, totally different kettle of fish. He, he obviously <laughs> should be... <laughs> close to the price of Mustachery, so, so the market's not too far wrong. Uh, in my view, I thought it was a poor lockinch, while Mustachery won, won well. I, I, I would probably be inclined to go a bit rogue here myself, just because I don't think the horses are that good in here. It's, it's not a vintage Queen Anne by any means. Um, and while they set a fairly good standard, I don't think they're sort of vintage standard. And I was quite taken by Hazapore, um, who hasn't had much racing and is two from two over eight furlongs. Um, he ran in the derby behind Massar, which I think was a good race. He was obviously a blatant non-stayer and he was quite a good winner last time, um, beating verbal dexterity quite easily. 
I mean, he's a four-year-old that's only had eight starts. Frankie rides him. You know, you point to the low draw. I think he's perfectly drawn in four. You know, I'd probably be keen to to take on this at this form of the lock inch and, and go go a bit rogue. And he's obviously not. I don't think he's an each way play because I, I think the lock inch form will either come to the fore and be better than the rest, or it won't be. And so that's that's the angle I'd be taking him. I think win only at about ten to one. Um, you know, he just could be anything. To, Dermot Weld, you know, he's looked after him. If you go through, he obviously <coughs> wasn't fit on the first run this year. That was his first for over 250 days. Um, dropped to eight furlongs last time and won really well. I just think, it, I just think it's a, a poor race myself. Um, the steady money has a poor as well. I think about 25 to 1. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think the money will come for him, I think, because, it, you know, you've either got a lot of lock-in choices or you don't. Uh, the market's dominated by them. I wasn't overly taken with Barney Roy um, and it's worth keeping an eye on Charger Bridge if the money did come he won um, the big handicap on Champions Day last year in very soft ground at the course he clearly likes the course um, I was a bit disappointed with him the last twice he certainly was poor in the lock inch ground was the problem he, he was very quick too, there too quick for him, yeah. exactly so it was quick there it was quick at Sandown um, if they were to get, you know, it's going to be on the, it's not going to be good to firm no. by the start of tomorrow anyway. If there was happened to be rain beforehand, I would probably want to see quite a lot of rain for him, which is annoying that it's not coming earlier in the day. But 25, he, you know, he could run a big race. But I mean, yeah, I'm, I think it's a, a very open race. I'd probably chance Hazapur at 10s. I think he could, he could surprise. Hazapur 10 to 1 um, with most firms, and that is for, for Mike Lebrevido, still seems to be the order of the day for, for Andy, despite. Um, being well supported since that 14 to 1 went up and then a couple of outsiders keeping an eye on there as well in one master and possibly charge bridge uh, on to the second now and uh, the coventry um and there's been a fair bit of money for a horse in this uh, today arizona is still the five to two favorite but threat is now seven to two for richard hannon was about i think about six to one 24 hours ago um he is a unibet ambassador and unibet released a video this morning of him saying it's his best chance of the week which may have something to do with that market move uh, Guildsman eight to one, um, Minoski twelve to one, Well of Wisdom fourteen to one, uh, Royal Lytham, uh, and Fort Myers sixteen to one, eighteen to one bar. Um, Andy, I'll come to you first here. I mean, I'm guessing that, that the market looks a little bit different now to how it did when you were when you were looking at this um, beforehand with that that market move for the second favourite. I mean, how were you looking at it before, and, and and do you see where that money's coming from? Yeah, um, I mean, having watched virtually every two-year-old race. Um, to the point of numbness almost um, over the last three three months and kept time figures and sectionals on every single race. Um, my two-year-old races are, are my favourite races to bet in at Royal Ascot. Um, um, I do think Arizona's the right favourite. Uh, I, I, I was worried about the potential of soft ground being the order of the day if the, the rain would have carried on like it did last week, but now it's drying out. I think it'll suit him because he's a beautiful mover. I know there's a lot of guys out there now, you know, your Simon Rowlands is of this world who do big articles on stride lengths and stride patterns. And I'd imagine that they've got this horse, you know, off the scale, yeah. the sort of way he moves. Um, so he'd definitely want the better ground. He'd come up against a good horse first time out. Little do we know at the time, but Sunday Sovereign, who beat him, is uh, arguably a, a world beater. And I think King Power have done the right thing by getting on their squad. Yeah. Um, his time figure was very good. I've, I've, I've checked it with a few of the time figure judges and I've got a slightly bigger one than he has. I've probably upgraded it because I've, I've took on board the sectional times he did as well from three out compared to the older horses on the card. Um, I think he's a very good horse. I think whatever beats Arizona will probably win. I've got a massive amount of spec for threat. I thought they would probably run him again just to get a bit more experience. Arizona's had the two, he's only had one, but the fact that Hannon has just given the one and he thought, that'll do, that's mm. my Coventry horse. I'd certainly respect. I think he's gone a ridiculously short price now myself at three to one. Uh, I don't know if you think we're pretty easy again tomorrow after the... the yeah, I mean, he was very impressive on the eye. His, his time was good. Look, his, his sections and everything about that new market were great. Um, it was quick ground. So this is obviously slightly easier for him, the ground. Um, but the, the form of those that he beat that day, haven't, haven't, the ones that were behind him haven't quite endorsed the form as much as Arizona's race. I, I think Guildsman's a big player. It's a bit of a quick turnaround, um, but he clocked a very good time. A time in keeping with a Group 1 or Group 2 two-year-old at, at Goodwood. I think if it would have gone the other way softer, 
not genuine soft. He, he would be around about a four or five to one shot now, not rather than eight to one, but I'd still think he's a player. There's obviously one or two other nice horses coming through, your Raw Lithams, your, your Fort Myers of this world, Maxi Boy, but they haven't done anything on the clock to suggest that they're quite in Arizona's ca- uh, class. Um, on Maxi Boy, because that was an interesting race where kind of everything went wrong, went wrong in running and yeah. he came through on the bridle and, and, and won fairly cosily in the end. I mean, how does that rank in your Yeah, he, he, he looked good on the eye, but again, I'm a time figure man, so on what he did on the bare numbers that day, he's got to find an absolute yeah. ton. Now, he's a very t- tall, scopey horse, and mm. Jamie Spencer rode him lovely that day, and I'm sure Jamie will give him the same confident run, he'll come through, but... Arizona, does, he just keeps lengthening and lengthening and lengthening. This is a totally different kettle fish to running in a slowly run race at Yarmouth, whereas Arizona has gone flat out at the Curra, yeah. stiff six furlongs and kept lengthening all the way to the line. A lot of these are going to have a culture shot. They won't know what's hitting when they come up against horses like Arizona, who just keeps pounding and pounding and pounding. So like I say, whatever beats Arizona will win, I think he's the right price. Whether he's a bet at 5-2 to two is out to question. Uh, Gildsman, I think he's the value at 8-1 to one if he's still... Looking for something at a bigger, bigger price. Yeah, eight to one with three six five, uh, and they are standout best price. And perversely, Mike, I quite want you to sit here now and tell us that Arizona is a, uh, a vulnerable favourite again. But uh, <laughs> how, are you, how are you eyeing, eyeing this up? I think there's four that come to there's four horses which I think will come to the fore. Arizona and Threat, the two they look they look short enough for me, but I think they're probably in the right position in the market. I, I'd struggle to say that Arizona or Threat were a bet at that price. Um, I was impressed enough with Arizona. I wasn't, I wasn't quite of the view that he was a superstar, but I think he could be. You know, he couldn't do any more than what he did last time. Um, I think he would need to step up to win the Coventry, but he certainly is capable of, of doing that. The, the two from, from England that I thought were the best two, Minoski, I, I, was, I love him. I mean, he's enormous. There's not many trainers would have even had him running, let alone had two runs um, at this stage, but Mark Johnson... You know, he cracks on with them. If they're good enough, he always wants to give them two runs. Uh, he was second behind Bombproof, who has had a setback, so sadly won't make Ascot. Um, but, I mean, he was, he's about a foot taller than Bombproof as well. And it, yeah. it, just wonder why he was even, you know, how he was even that ready at that time of the year. Um, he was very impressive at Pontefract. He absolutely slammed his rivals then, posting a good time um, up against a three-year-old novice later on the card that day. He would probably be be my bet at 12 to 1. I just think he could be really good. Mark Johnson's got a very good record with Ascot two-year-olds. You know, year <laughs> after year, churns out winners with them. Um, the likes of Main Edition. Um, you know, last year, every single year, he's got good two-year-olds. And you mentioned Maxi Boy. I, I was very, very impressed with him. I can see why the numbers, the, fit, the time was poor, because but they went so slow for that in that race. I mean, he was never going to post a good time. It was, it was impossible. Um, I'd have, I really don't like horses only having one run mm-hmm. I, I get the impression that while threat might be an absolute star he's he's got to have something's gone wrong in between there's there's no way you'd, you'd win that early in the season and just be like yeah they're not going to run him again um you know he's, they've got horses like temple of heaven in there you know he's had three runs in the same in the same period and oh purple rain you know he's, they, they churn them out quickly i just don't think it's the right you know, maybe it was nothing. Maybe he had a tiny problem in it. You know, it, was, mm. it, it hasn't made any difference. But I'd still like to see him run again. And uh, Maxi Boy, again, you know, they, they thought he was a Coventry horse before Yarmouth. But one run puts me off a little bit. But I, it wouldn't be surprised to see him run very well at 22s. But uh, Minoski, who's 12-1 to 1 generally, is, is my, my bet. But he Good. might well give Arizona the perfect lead into the race as well. <laughs> if you look on the odds checker grids, you can see all the place terms and some firms are four places here. So if we're going to back Minoski, I would recommend getting the 12 to 1 with Labrooks, uh, Betfair Sportsbook, uh, Bet Victor, and Paddy's and Betway are all paying four places and they are all best price 12 to 1. Um, Maxi Boy is currently 22 to 1 with both Bet Victor and Coral who and Black Type. Um, Bet Victor and Coral both playing, uh, paying four places as well there if you're going to have an each way bet. Um, so a few there to get stuck into. It sounds like um, we're maybe more positive on, on the quality of the Coventry um, than the Queen Anne with a few horses there taking uh, both of your fancy. Um, on to the, the King's Stand now, the Group 1. Uh, and this looks like a fascinating race, not only at the top of the market, but all the way through the field. Um, Batash is the uh, classic price of 17 to 8 with Unibet. So um, cheers for them. 2 to 1, two to one generally. Uh, Blue Point is 3 to 1. Um, Sergei uh, Prokofiev is 8 to 1. 
Mavs cross nine to one, uh, twelve to one bar. Let's start with uh, with the top two. Um, Patash obviously mightily impressive uh, last time out, but which Patash will turn up here? Um, and then of course Blue Point comes with it with a huge reputation as well. So Andy, how are you? Firstly, let's talk about the top two and how are you approaching these. I think we all know Batash is probably the most gifted of horses when he's right. There's no doubt about that. Um, time figure wise, he, he did numbers which literally were barely believable at Haydock. The fact that Mabs Cross, who's a very, very fast horse uh, in her own right, could not lay a glove on um, Batash that day suggests that they were going at a helter skelter pace. And that, that's the dilemma that punters face. They know that if Batash brings his A game to the table, he will probably win this. Uh, I think he's probably got more overall natural speed than what Blue, Blue Point has. Interestingly as well, I think this is a, a, a very fascinating tactical battle and a point worth making. The two big guns here are drawn either side. You've got Batash drawn installed 12, and you've got um, Blue Easy, Point drawn yeah. installed 1. Yeah. Now, depending on how the first two races, of course, pan out, which side of the track is, is, is favoured will probably adjust itself with the betting. Um, but let's say Batash runs a solo time trial from store 12, like I think he probably will. Um, he could get a freebie and he could, he could be very difficult to beat. I don't see any, any horse in this race, despite them all being very fast, getting anywhere near him early on. Um, I mean, obviously, he's, he was shy disappointing last year when trying to um, um, do this, exactly the same tactics. Um, and I think he probably, on his day, beat Blue Point and turn the form around. The, the interesting betting angle for me there, here, however, I mean, sometimes I look at a race like this, I think, well, what's the most likely way of me making money out of this without having a massive amount of risk? Sky, sky bet four places? There's a couple of firms going to go four <laughs> places, but I'll be very, very keen on a place-only bet somewhere in around the 7-4, to 2-1 to one mark for Mabs Cross just because of her reliability factor. Mm. She's always, always in the frame. Winner of the Abbey from a bad draw. Won first time out, won the Palace House. As I said, Haydock didn't really play into her strengths last time out, albeit she was beaten fair and square on the day. But this is a stiffer five. This is where Mabs Cross comes into her own. Yes, she was beaten in this race last year, but it was good to firm. The ease in the ground will definitely bring the others back to her if it's good to soft. I think whatever happens, Mabs Cross will be in the first three stroke four. So if, if I can get seven to four two to want to place a Mabs Cross, then I'm sort of pushing all my chips in there with that, rather than thinking, well, I've got to back Batash at two to one and everything's got to go right. I haven't got to worry about what happens to Batash in Blue Point because I know they're going to go off a million and I want something to be picking up the pieces over a track, obviously, that plays, that plays into the hands of deep closers. So that's my betting strategy. Um, I probably will have a decent bet on each way on Mabs Cross. Um, with four places and, and particularly that, that place Thanks, only well, two firms are out at the moment right, in that top three market Bet Victor have Mavs Cross at six to four and Spread X uh, yeah. fixed have, have seven or four Hopefully so some, yeah. If, yeah if I can get seven or four in and around that mark I'll be more than happy to take take a few quid out of that good stuff and, and Mike I mean it, it's, it's quite a difficult um, race to I mean as, as Andy said Batash supremely talented and, and on his day possibly unbeatable really but um Obviously, Blue Point won this race last year, beating Batash. Batash only won two of his last five starts. So, how do you approach this from a kind of a, a punting viewpoint? <laughs> it's a no bet race for me. <laughs> I think you know, it's, you, you, Blue Point. Obviously, it's a brilliant race. You know, you got the one-two from last year coming back again. That you know, the draw throws things up in the air. Had, had Blue Point been drawn five or six, <laughs> it's it's such a tough. I mean, Batash. He's yet to win at Ascot. He doesn't look the same horse. I no. think he's a real speedball. And these figures he's posting, he's posting mm. real speed courses like yeah. Goodwood and Haydock. I mean, horses with Haydock, I just don't think have got a brilliant record at, at Ascot. You mm. always look at the likes of Harry Angel, you know, yeah. brilliant figures at, at Newmarket in the July Cup, speed track, mm. Haydock, speed track, York. Yeah. You know, and they come to these courses um, like Ascot. And I thought this horse, one of the favourites later on in the in the week as well. Invincible Army for me has the same profile, but don't think they're as good when they come to Ascot. Um, there's quite a few of them. You know, he, he he was nowhere in the in the Golden Jubilee last year. He, we'll get to him later on, I'm sure. And just wonder whether it's not really his deal, Ascot. And as a result, I, th I don't think you could back him at two to one. 
you know, can you make can you back Blue Point, a horse we haven't even seen in England this year? At three, he's prob- probably not again. But you know, he's got the same prep as last year when he won. Mab's cross. I mean, I I think you're right in the, the place terms. Is she's the reliable one? The ground should be fine. The court, she'll love the course of all the horses in there. She will probably love it more than any of them will. But if Batash and Blue Point turn up on their A game, she won't beat them. No, I'm not. I'm only, I'm only after a first. Yeah. Race. <laughs> but, <laughs> I just, All I'm uh, saying is I'd rather back at the prices. If you gave me seven or four Mavs Cross to finish in the first or two to one three Batash. or two to one Batash to win, yeah, yeah. What, what, where, where's the bet? To tell you, being a yeah. bit just without the two fab. So what would you, ra- what would you rather do if, you had to, yeah, if yeah. your life depended on it? <laughs> I'll ask you that question. That should be the question you always ask yourself. I think <laughs> Mav, Mavs Cross is, is, more, is more reliable and seven to four. Um, actually, for, for me, is, I mean, I, I don't personally think there's an absolute bundle of juice in seven to four i mean yes yeah, she's very reliable Pro- probably should hit the frame but i it's a no bet bet race for me as it stands i, I think it really you know equilateral falls in the same same boat i, I really fancied him at newmarket and he got nailed on the line by her <coughs> um he was in front far too long but again i think he's a proper speedball and needs to make the running he could be taking Batash on because I think that's the way he needs to be ridden. Um, every time they hold him up, he runs poorly. Um, for, for me, I, I think Blue Point is probably the, the most likely winner. All things taken into account. No. So you'd say no better race, but you'd probably have the favourites other around? Yeah. I, I'd ha- I think they should probably be joint favourites. Okay. okay. I think, you know. Batash should be slightly bigger and Blue Point. I mean, you, you, you don't want to be having Blue Point or Batash in each way multis. I mean, both of them could complete, could either yeah. win or bomb out, and that, that probably does suit the Mavs cross place better. But it's a very tricky race. With, you got so many different angles. Now, yeah. <laughs> He's talking himself into <laughs> the Mavs cross. Uh, I mean, are there any, any, uh, any, I mean, Imprimis could presumably be anything um, over from America. Exactly. Um, I mean, yeah. Out, out of three, could, you know, if it's one of those American speeders, could give uh, Blue Point a nice turn. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he could get the lead. That's the thing. He's another, another angle where we, there's so many unknowns in here that, from a punting point of view, for me, it's just a race to watch, really. You know, it'll be one of those races that after it's run, when you've seen what, what all of them are going to do, how they're going to play their hand, it, it will be quite quite obvious that what the play should have been. But at the moment, I think, <laughs> which obviously sounds... That's the, that's the betting insight that we love. Of After course. Race, we'll know who you should have backed. But, you know, you're gonna, we don't know if Equilateral is going to take Batash on. We don't know if Imprimis is going <laughs> to give Blue Point a lovely lead. And we don't know how Batash is going to fare and how he's going to get to the start. And maybe it's one of those that, you know, you wait and see how Batash gets to the start. But I think there are so many angles. I mean, they're going to go fast and... I think, yeah, it's a, it's a very t- tricky race. Let's hope we can make more sense then for the, for the listeners and the viewers. Although, I mean, the map's crossed. We've got a strong selection from Andy. Yeah, yeah. If, uh, exactly. Right to the point. Uh, seven to four. So St. James's, uh, St. James's Pad Estates, uh, another Route 1, uh, which is the fourth race on the card on Tuesday. And it's um, <coughs> another really interesting um, market. Again, we've got Phoenix of Spain, the, the hero from the Curra, winning the 2000 Guineas and some star for Charlie Hills, is the 15 to 8 favourite. Uh, Tudan Hot, who's had a disappointing um, start to, to the season despite coming run, runner up twice but both times failing to justify um, the hype that we saw uh, at the end of last season and over the winter uh, King of Comedy 13 to 2 um, 12 to 1 bar some interesting runners though at those prices when you've got the likes of Circus Maximus at 12 to 1 Fox Champion the very progressive horse at 25 to 1 uh, Mike I'll come to you first here and, and again how are you doing the top two of the market and are, are there any others that you're looking at for an each way each way play uh, yeah yeah um... I think the top two are very solid. Phoenix of Spain's obviously a big horse. He, he'll love the ground. He's got a very solid chance. Too darn hot. He's, he's the one that could, could bounce back and he could yeah. win this really well. I mean, they rushed him to, to the Dante to see if he was a derby horse. They, they, they made their mind up within about 10 minutes after the race that he didn't start, didn't stay. And so they rushed him back to Ireland. You know, he's had a terrible preparation for any career. And I think if they could do it all again, then, then they would. You, um, you know, Ireland was obviously a mistake. They shouldn't have gone in hindsight, but hindsight, he's come too quick. He's had <coughs> two hard races, though, so you could almost take him on on the back of that as well. Um, for me, the price are probably about right, but it wouldn't surprise me if too darn hot fared well. I'm going to put one up here, a horse that I really like. He's 80-1 to 1 with Labrooks. Bell Rock, 
won his only start at Newmarket as a two-year-old. He missed the guineas, but he was then held up behind King of Comedy um, last time out, who is 11 to two in here. King of Comedy was much better positioned in the race, and Bell Rock didn't get a clear run, but, but, uh, near enough finishing on the bridle towards the end of the race. Um, you know, that race should have put him spot on for this. <laughs> There is a chance that he'll finish like fourth or fifth. Will you take, I mean, I think when you back but, in 80 to 1 shot, I think you'll take. You know. um, yeah, 80 to 1 is, is, is huge for him. I mean, you look at the horses that are shorter than him, I, I don't think he's got anything to find with the likes of Fox Champion and Circus Maximus. I think he looks in the same, same grade as them. And in a race where I don't think, I think a lot of these that are in between the sort of 6 to 1 and 20 to 1 mark are a solid group three and group two horses, I'd be really happy to take a chance on on Bell Rock at 80 to 1. Um, I think he could go really close. Well, that's what this is all about, tipping up 80 to 1 shots. Ashin Murphy currently booked, so let's hope that uh, he has a slightly better preparation for, for Ascot than he had for Salisbury yesterday. Um, Andy, you, yeah, again, so let's talk about Phoenix of Spain and Two Down Hot, and uh, knowing you, I'm sure there's, there's one that you're looking for a nice elite train play as well. Yeah, I, I think this is a great race. Fascinating in every every department. So nice shout from from Mike with Bell Rocky. He was a bit unlucky that day at Sandown. I don't think he would have beaten the winner, mind. Um, he probably might have finished third, I think, in, in retrospect, having watched it a few times. Uh, but at eighty to one, look, you know, if yeah. the King of Comedy wins and he's he's uh, you know runs to the Sandown form, then he has got half a chance of nicking the frame. Um, I was very impressed with Phoenix of Spain in Ireland. Uh, it was interesting the tactics they were employed that day as well. Um, to my um, to my memory, the, the times when he's won and, and uh, all his best races have been coming off the speed. I think probably Jamie overegged the pudding at Doncaster. He gave him a little bit too much to do that day, so they rode him forward, and that, that seemed to to work out. Now whether they're going to try and make the running or uh, do something funky again at Ascot um, remains to be seen. I wouldn't really be too keen on. I'm not too keen on any front runners at Ascot on the round track. I think that's suicidal. Um, so he'd probably be best served just to drop him behind the, behind the pace. It's interesting that the two horses, they've gone their own separate ways, but Phoenix explaining King of Comedy ran mm. on Sandown um, in a maiden last year, and King of Comedy came out a comfortable winner. But back in the field was Phoenix of Spain, who caught the eye massively that day with a tender ride. Phoenix of Spain has gone in his route round the Group 1s, and, and he's where he is. But King of Comedy has been brought along very steadily with a view... To, to get into this point, very yeah. similar to last year's winner of this race. Um, what, what won this race last year again now? The winner of this. You put me on the spot here. Sorry. I do all my prep. Uh, without Parole won last year. Of course. And Without Parole won exactly the same Sandown race that King of Comedy did, uh, which I think is interesting. Now, Frankie's obviously got a stale lot to too darn hot. Um, you know, he's, he's big pals with um, the Lloyd Webbers, of mm. course, and he's ridden the horse and he thinks a lot of it. But I think deep down he'll be thinking... Well, King of Comedy is a right proper danger here. <laughs> he is a bit of a so-and-so, this horse. He's a bit of a monkey. Remember him going out sand down, down the road to Dendron Walk and he was, he was, he was being a bit of a playboy. Um, you wouldn't go to the start. He didn't want to know. So obviously, yeah. Obviously, <laughs> Could have a delay to this one. <laughs> obviously Ascot, you know, he's, he's, I don't know whether they're going to put earplugs in him or do something or put a hood on him in the parade ring or try and do something to calm him down. But he's very much one, similar to a few horses like your Batashis and your Librevidos. I think you probably need just to watch him, yeah. how he goes to the side, how he takes in the preliminaries, if he's calm and if he does go down and plays ball. I think if he harnesses all the, the nervous energy that he has got into, uh, into his race, he could easily win this. I think he's got one of the most, I think he's one of the most talented horses in this field. He's time figure at Yarmouth when he beat two very good horses by a long, long way. The form of which has worked out really well, by the way. Um, suggested to me that He's a group horse. I wrote my card that day, group one horse. Um, I put him up at Sandown when he won that night and he, he justified favouritism. Um, Kirby's ridden him before as well. I think he rode him on debut when he on won debut, at Sandown. Yeah. yeah, so that's a nice little bit of symmetry. He's nicely drawn. I think he's a great bet at 11 to 2 if he gets down to the start. If he's that price on the off, which it should be a very strong market, shouldn't it, with uh, two Darn Hot and, and uh, Phoenix Expain in there, he would probably be my bet. Um, 
he's one of those ones that probably I'll put up on odd checker, but with an asterisk. Watch him going down to the start. <laughs> this is this is a, a point. I don't think you can do that. This is a point each way, but the point each way comes with the turn. And then, and then when he goes down well and comes comes fifth, you can say oh, I didn't. Like, I told I didn't you like so. I yeah, I told you he was going to ball <laughs> over. Uh, I certainly respect the French horse Shaman. He looks more of a a soft ground slogger without being disrespectful for him. He got outpaced last time out and then ran on very nicely at the end. Um, I think he, he probably wanted a bit softer, but yeah, it's a fascinating race. But King of Comedy, if I've got to put up a tip now at the prices, he'd be the each way choice because I think he's just so talented. So King of Comedy, 13 to 2 best price at the moment, and that's with Spread X. And then as I say, Mike tipping up an 80 to 1 horse, only 80 to 1 with Labrooks. Be interesting to see how long that price lasts after this goes out. I wouldn't have thought too long. Um, We'll move on now to uh, to what have we got next? Um, the Ascot Stakes. We've got next. the Ascot Stakes. Yes, sorry, I was on the wrong grid. Um, so the Ascot Stakes here. Uh, we've got Build Me Up Buttercup as the nine to two favourite. Uh, Mengli Khan making a, a return to the flat at six to one. Uh, Curdle Leon at fifteen to two. Uh, Bats Rocket at twelve to one. Snow Falcon at fourteen to one. Um, Kerosene at fourteen to one. Uh, this market is slightly all over the shop at the moment, but um, with uh, Build Me Up Buttercup as short as three to one in places. Um, Snow Falcon, as I said, 14 to one with a couple of firms, eight to one with another. So uh, I'm sure by the time we get to, to race time, it'll look fairly different. Um, again, Mike, I'll come to you first here. Um, where, where are you looking? So for me, this is a, the big weather watching race, in my opinion. I'm not too keen on these jumps horses. Yeah. Um, they, they look like they're priced up a bit because of who trains them, which obviously the jump boys have got a very good record. Um, so it's no surprise to see them those prices. But there are three in here which have big chances. Cur de Leon has a massive chance. He needs soft ground. So if they were to get this rain tomorrow and it poured, he, he's got a huge chance. He won the Chester Cup consolation race on heavy ground. Second in the Cesarich last year. Uh, no, sorry, in the... So, sorry, second, he was tailed in the Cesarich, but that was too fast. And he'd been a good second first time out this year in an obvious prep for the Chester Cup. This is the, his target for the entire year. Um, but he needs rain. If it was going to rain, I mean, I'd struggle to have him out the first three or four if it ran. I mean, 15 to 2 each way. I mean, you've got... I don't think you even need six places that Skybat and Paddy Power are playing with the fifth of the odds. I think just take four places and a quarter, uh, get the better place terms. I, th- I think he'll definitely be there. Mengli Khan, I, I can't see him staying that trip if it was to go slightly soft. Um, but I'm going to put two up at a, at a much bigger price. Kurt Leon's if it rains. I'm going to put two more up. Um, the first one is the Grand Vizier, who would handle cut, but probably wouldn't want it to be a slog. Um, Ian Williams in Connections paid 180000 for this horse in October um, obviously to be a dual purpose horse it didn't really work out over hurdles um, but I thought it was very interesting that he was rated 101 and they decided to run him 10 days what will be 10 days ago at Newmarket where he was held up and never really put in the race um, very kindly, the handicap has dropped him one pound, one pound, which means he can run in this race off a hundred. It's a naught to a hundred handicap. Um, he's a very talented horse who obviously looks the part. They paid that much money for him. Um, Ian Williams will know how to get one right. Um, he's got a very solid record on the flat. He's won some big handicaps. He stays well. Um, he's twenty-five to one. Um, there was 33 to 1 with Bet365, Victor, and a few others. I mean, he could easily bounce back to form here. I think, you know, this, we might be looking back at that new market run where he's one pound, been dropped one pound, and thinking that was a brilliant bit of placement from Ian Williams. Um, I think he's got a massive chance. I mean, and the other one, who probably wouldn't want it to go that soft, but is interesting, is time to study. Um, it's a shock that you've, you've tipped up the three horses that are all blue and odds I know, all blue. <laughs> <laughs> They're the only three which are blue and odds um, This horse was second over two miles in a group three behind Torcedor um, just over 12 months ago. Um, and he was sixth in the Northumberland plate off 108. Now this horse has managed, he's lost his weight <clears> and he's dropped down to 96. Um, Jim Crowley, who's got a very good record for Ian Williams overall, is jocked up on him. Um, he wouldn't want the rain, so he would be the one I'd be a bit cautious of. Um, he's about 20 to 1 generally. Uh, and I think those three would be my three. I'd be watching the weather. 
um, up until the race. You know, time to study if it was to stay quick would be a win only bet. I wouldn't be chancing him each way. Um, and then if it was to, to rain, I'd be having a pretty chunky bet on curd line each way at 15 to 2. And I think the ground is here at 33. So I, I mean, this could be, this could be, he could have loads in hand, this horse. He could be a proper Ebor and Melbourne Cup horse, this horse. Ooh. That is some line, Matt. I think I'm going to have the, uh, the 80 to 1, 33 to 1 each way double. Can't wait. <laughs> um, yeah, so currently on 15 to 2, as you said. Um, but that's with 365 Hills, uh, Unibet, Bet Victor, <coughs> Betway, and Spread X. Um, and then uh, Time to Study, currently best price, 22 to 1 with Spread X. But I have a feeling by the time this is released, that will probably be gone, given um, he's a short 16 in a fair few places. Uh, and then the, uh, the, Grand, the Grand Vizier. Ahead of his uh, Melbourne Cup till is uh, is thirty three to one at the moment. Uh, Bet Victor, Bet Fred, Tote Sport, Ball Sports, and three six five. Andy, how do you follow that? Um, yeah, Mike mentioned at the start of his of his uh, preamble that um, he's not that bonkers on jump trainers in this race, but horses, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. The, the the stats are telling you that the jump 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 trainers, jump boys, are are the ones to be with here, uh, whether they've got flat horses or, or a combination of both. David Pipe, Nicky Henderson, Willie Mullins, Charles Burns, John Joyner, Willie Mullins, Jahad Fahi, Willie Mullins, Willie Mullins. <laughs> Are your last eight or nine Averages in this race. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's where we need to be looking. Um, Just Mike, think they're, <clears> they're, they're, they're bringing over a worse class of horse yeah. this year compared to usual, is what I would say. My foot that's, no that's my view on them. Yeah, my footnotes and my... my um, sort of next um, approach to, was to say that I don't think we've got the normal Willie Mullins battalions in this race. Obviously, he won it last year with Lagos to Vegas, yeah. uh, who was seemingly blotting the weights. Uh, you know, your Thomas Hobson's of this world. Um, probably genuine group three horses, you could argue. Um, well, I don't think there's any argument about it. This Bill Me at Buttercup, I, I, I've watched her quite a few times in, over in Ireland, over Jumpson, just think she completely and utterly lost the plot. Uh, she actually got pulled up last time we saw her at Punchestown. She literally went to her hurdles and like puked. She just lit, it was as if like she'd never seen a hurdle in her life. Um, she was horrible that day in the grade one behind Honeysuckle at Fairy House. Um, so you've really got to ask yourself, I'm, I'm backing this horse just on the reliability of Willie Mullins having the right, the right ammunition. He, he could have probably entered a whole batch of horses in this but the fact that he's gone for this one out of all his yard um, is, is obviously testimony to, to what he thinks and we have got to remember that this horse actually has won at the track as well when it was previously with um, Mick Shannon I think it won a bumper back in the day um, it's also got the tongue tie on for the first time that, that might have partly had something to do with one of the reasons why she hasn't been running that well over in Ireland um, so it's one of those ones where you think this will be a proper Willie Mullins special if he manages to pull this off. He's also drawn 19 or 20. Now, the draw... There are, there, this, I don't think this is a maximum field anymore. We used to get in the days where there were 30 odd runners in this. Um, so it's probably not as bad as what it used to, but it, it is what it is. Still 19 or 20 is not great. So I do think she's relatively poor value at 7 or 2, 4 to 1, having um, um, said all we need to say. I totally agree with Mike here with, with Cour de Leon. I backed this horse in this race last year. I think I actually put it up two points mm. each way. I was so confident in this horse finishing in the first four or five. I think there were a few firms that went six places and he did nick six. But he got a horrendous run through in the hands of yeah. Martin Harley. I think he somehow managed to, from being drawn well, end up turning for home with about four or five behind it. On he weaved his, as well. Yeah, he weaved his way through the field and ended up finishing six and saved our bacon. But he, sh he should have gone much closer than that. He's been... Beautifully campaigned this season. I actually think the horse that beat him at Newbury first time out should have been in this race, Core Blimey. Yeah. Whether they're saving that for the Queen Alexandra, I don't know. Um, but if the heavens open and if it was soft on Saturday, he'd be a big player. Thorhammer Hansen, decent £5 claimer. He rode him last time out as well when he won in a slog at Chester. He's nicely drawn in the middle. And obviously Alan King, he's having a terrific time with things on the flat as well. Beringer has been flying the flag. So everything looks right for Keir de Leon. Um, some firms, five, six places, 15 to 2, 7 or 1, he'll do for me. So finally, five races into Ascot Tuesday, and we have the two experts agreeing on something, so that's good. I, I think he, he could go, if it rains, he could go off. Yeah, if that rain does come, yeah. yeah. He, he should be very close to being favourite, because he, yeah. he's the proper 
He could go a four to one favourite. Yeah, tomorrow. he's been there and bought the t-shirt in these kind of events, hasn't he? If people listen to this and it gets to four twenty to five on on, on Tuesday and they're, they're looking to have their bet and and it's the, the going's still good, the rain hasn't come, and Curly on is still fifteen to two. Do you still have the bet? I, I think he he's still a good each way bet. Yeah, okay. it's not going to be fast ground. Everything's going to be right for him anyway. The more rain there is, the more it will yeah. suit him. And it is good, good to soft. Is it yeah. soft, good to soft, soft in places yeah. down on the rain yeah, track? So down, down there, Swindley Bottom, where he's under the trees and, and perhaps there's a bit more moisture in the ground, it's going to be ideal. Yeah. And when he's turning for home, it's good ground, good to soft in places. The straight, he's running up hills, so it's not a problem. It just isn't good to firm like it was yeah. last year. So tomorrow, if you're in Yaskat Car Park and you're having a picnic. <laughs> You're about to tuck into a pork pie and you feel a couple of raindrops. Don't get the umbrella. Grab your phone and yeah. back cordially on it. Don't worry about it. Just embrace it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do a rain dance. Yeah. Uh, on to the last race of the day, <clears throat> Mr. Wolferton. Um, and we have El Arkham is the four to one favourite. Magic Wand at five to one. Um, Edeb is seven to one. Star of Bengal, nine to one. Uh, Latrobe, nine to one. Twelve to one bar. Uh, Andy, go, come to my left first mm-hmm. and, uh, and ask you what looks like a fairly open race. Yeah, I'll probably do this race a little bit more uh, on the train home tonight and, and um, when I get back in the office because at the moment I haven't got a massive view I think the favourite's the right favourite Al Khan Qu- quick time last time out at Goodwood they went very fast and he bounced back to the kind of form which suggested he's a 110 horse um, th- they really fancied him first time out uh, I speak to someone who's quite quietly associated with the Mark Johnson stable and they, they thought he was he was right first time after a wind operation. He ran in snatches that day, kind of like rolled around into the dip and didn't quite run up to scratch, but it wasn't a total loss course. Fourth to Zabiel Prince, as it stands, is still a decent effort. But he put it all together when he beat Willie John last time out. Really good, he was always up with the speed, quick and on demand, and wouldn't look a good horse. He's nicely drawn, conditions are fine for him. I can't see him not running well, but like I said, the market has found him at four to one. Riven Light is probably one of the most talented horses in this field. He should have won last time out at uh, the Curra, but in a muddling sort of race, he, he, he got out a bit late. Um, I can see him being a bit of a gamble or a horse that might run, run out, outrun his odds. I didn't really see that many others. Latrobe, obviously, he's a classy horse, you know, Irish um, yeah, derby winner. Um, but, you know, he's, he's a mile and a quarter and he's a mile and a half horse. So... Like I said, at the moment, I haven't got a, I haven't got a standout bet in the race. I mean, I might, I might end up going for Alcom if. Well, I think, I think that's lucky because we're running out of time, and I know we yeah, have a bet. Perfect, takes, yeah. <laughs> so if you want to just wrap out. it up, move on. Yeah, then Mike, I'd say well, Alcom for this for this podcast purposes, but I haven't had a bet. Alcom for Andy, uh, Mike. I think Alcom's a bet. I mean, you say he was, he, you say disappointing when he was fourth, but as you say, you know, Zabil Prince, Forest Ranger, mm. and you know Lockins win a Mustachery in front of him that day. I, I, I think. He's got to give a lot of weight to Magic One, but her form this year hasn't been as good as it was last year. She was third in the Group One, Grade One in America last time, but that form hasn't worked out. I, I, Alarcan, as long as it doesn't absolutely pour, I'd be very worried if it was to go very soft for him. But if it doesn't rain at four to one from stall three, he, he could be very, very hard to beat. He, I think he's the best horse in the race. As you say, last time, I think... It's just a repeat of last time should yeah, be enough to win this. Yeah. And four to one, while there are a lot of runners, I mean, from stall three, he's got a lovely way of racing. He, he, I imagine he's going to have near enough the box seat. He's going to have every chance. I'd be, four to one looks a bit big to me. Um, he'd definitely be my bet in there. There we go. Alar Kam at four to one for Mike in the last. Thank you very much for listening or for watching, however you've digested this. And thanks to Andy and Mike. We are recording previews for every day of Royal Ascot. So if you've enjoyed this, then please find the other ones. We're going to do Wednesday now and make sure you keep uh, up to date with everything on Odds Checker. Andy's columns will be going out the night before, will they? Or on the morning? Um, we'll find out. Yeah. We'll find out. They'll, they'll, they'll be up there uh, a long time before racing, so make sure you pounce on those before the prices go and make sure you check the Odds Checker grids to get the best odds for your bet and the best each way pl- uh, places as well.